We're joined also today by the Urban Bird Collective, and I will let folks, um, uh, Monica, Melissa, and Laureen, introduce themselves a little bit here. Um, I'm also a member of the Urban Bird Collective, but, but a newish member and um, a newish birder as well. So um, really happy to be part of this group doing really great work. So Monica, I'll pass it off to you for intro. Great. Uh, thanks, Maggie. So uh, I'm Monica Bryan. Uh, I um, started the Urban Bird Collective uh, about a little over three, three years ago. Um, and the Urban Bird Collective is, it was started as um, what we wanted to do is to create safe space, um, take people out, uh, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the LGBT uh, community, and uh, let them be able to enjoy the enjoy, enjoy nature um, like everyone else. So um, we have leaders who help um, create those safe spaces uh, on the walks, and so um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm also um, the executive director of, um, co-executive director of Voices for Racial Justice. So yeah, uh, I'll give it to Melissa. I'm not muted. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking the time to be with us today. Um, Melissa Michener, she, her, hers pronouns, and um, been with the collective um, from probably its early beginnings a um, couple years ago and uh, have really dove into birding and being a part of this group uh, as a collective, as a community of um, individuals. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about birding, talk about um, the spaces in which we conducted our counts and continue to um, uh, surround ourselves in, um, and then hear from all of you uh, where you're at, where you're going, um, and maybe some questions about, um, about this activity that uh, so many of us uh, have passions for. As Sam would say, he's not a birder, but he's, you know, already um, went from zero to 100. <laughs> so looking forward to our chat today um, and talking more about the collective, talking more about this thing called the Christmas bird count uh, and sharing stories with all you. And I'll pass it on to Laureen. Thanks, Melissa. Good morning, everyone. I'm Laureen Lee. I use uh, she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, and I joined the collective uh, about a year ago, um, and I've been doing bird watching for about three years. Um, and this is a, a really special group to me because um, it brings together a lot of my passions. Um, one of them being uh, the, the outdoors uh, and being able to be in green spaces and especially being able to connect in green spaces in an urban setting and this idea that the natural world is all around us, whether you're in a city or you're in the country or wherever you are. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here um, with you all today to share um, about bird watching and winter birding here um, in Minnesota, Minnesota and specifically um, about this space um, that the Lower Valen Creek Project is a, um, a steward for. And we're really excited to partner with them. And we did our first Christmas bird count, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And hopefully we'll get to do again um, next year and in the year's future. Great, thanks, Laureen. Thanks everybody for introducing yourselves. Oh yeah, I just wanted to, uh, to put this slide up so folks can see that the, this amazing logo that the Urban Bird Collective has created. Monica, um, can you talk a little bit about the logo? Yeah, I know that was like a really cool, fun process, and I just yeah, yeah, and I again, I went over this really quickly, but um, this is just it's my passion. Um, so I've been a birder for over twenty years, and a photographer for maybe ten years, and I consider myself a birder first and a photographer second. Um, and you know, I really I would hear from folks, uh, especially uh, BIPOC uh, folks, who didn't feel like they were welcomed in community, and so. Um, this is why I started the Urban Bird Collective. Um, I, at first, I thought, oh, you know, we're going to create, you know, these, you know, birders, and they're going to they're going to be awesome in it. And then it was just like, no, we just need to create space for people to go out and enjoy nature. 
Um, the Urban Bird Collective has folks from all levels, um, beginning, we're there to learn together. Um, and again, we have about 15 leaders who, uh, you know, go out on walks with us, um, mainly in the Twin Cities. Um, I really, um, we don't have to travel all over the world to see the amazing birds that we have right here in the Twin Cities. We have an amazing flyway here. We have great green spaces. Um, and we want to take them back for BIPOC communities and the LGBT community. Um, this, the symbol of the raven, uh, the raven, this is the crow. Um, it could have been a raven, um, but the crow is really urban. Um, and then just the colors to um, be really inclusive of the LGBT community. Um, our, this logo was created by one of our um, collective uh, leaders. Um, oh my God, Heather, Heather Lou. Uh, yes. Um, and so she's a great artist and um, created a couple of these for us. And we have another one that's a sandhill crane. So yeah, we welcome uh, anybody to come and join us. We, um, we're on Facebook, we're the Urban Bird Collective, and we are primarily for BIPOC and LGBT, but we um, include all of our allies in our, in our work. Awesome. And one, and one thing I just, I wanted to mention is that when we use BIPOC, um, what it stands for is Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. So I know that that's kind of an acronym for for those terms. So just wanted to clarify that. So thanks, Monica. Yeah, thanks, Melissa, for clarifying that too. I use that term sometimes. And then, um, uh, you know, I've, I've had people ask, uh, can you explain that? What does that <laughs> mean? And I forget, like, obviously, um, not everybody knows what that means. So thanks for remembering that. And so Sam, if you want to pop ahead two slides. Um, today, we are really thankful to our sponsor, Capital Region Watershed, one of our best partners in our work to protect our green spaces and sacred sites on the east side and help us um, do, you know, environmental education with the community. Um, so appreciate them and all of their support. And then if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so this is, again, just a little bit about us. I kind of talked about we do the environmental education urban conservation, restoration, and cultural connections and healing work. So what does that exactly look like? Um, for our environmental education, we do uh, programs like this. We offer programs like this to the community uh, on a monthly basis. Um, some of those uh, include birding, like we're doing now. We've also done winter wildlife tracking. We do um, a pollinator festival every year. We bring in a lot of people together and uh, on the east side in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, but from a lot of different organizations from the DNR to the Bee Lab and um, provide that education for the community as well. Uh, that middle slide or photo shows um, some of our restoration projects. We partner a lot with local schools and youth groups to do restoration projects in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, which is our main work site. And then on the right there is cultural connections and healing as a native led organization on the east side. We do a lot of uh, programming that relates to how, how people view nature through their cultural lens. So this photo was uh, one of our programs on Indigenous Peoples Day. We, we hosted a panel uh, talking about Indigenous land acknowledgement. And that was a really great panel. Um, so we do programs like that. So um, next slide. And then uh, Monica talked a bit already about the Urban Bird Collective. I don't know if any of you want to expand on the community partnerships or education, citizen science aspects of the work. Yeah, I will say that um, the Urban Bird Collective, uh, you know, we, we go out into the, the Twin Cities parks the, in St. Paul, Minneapolis, and other, you know, close locations. Uh, but one of our big partners is the um, Minnesota River Valley National Wildlife Refuge. So the refuge uh, is massive, um, but some of our favorite places that we like to do walks are Bass Ponds, um, uh, Old Cedar Avenue Bridge, uh, and then the main visitor center um, in the Minnesota River Valley um, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and so that's our sort of home base. Um, and we, we love going there and we'd love you to join us. Um, our other partner that helps uh, with some financial support is the Savala Hoya grant. Um, that really got us started the Urban Bird Collective. And so we wanna um, acknowledge um, their support as well. Great, thank you. Um, if Melissa and Laureen don't have anything to add, I'll go into the next slide. Um, so we're gonna just jump into the 
the winter birding now that you know a little bit about who we are on this call and um, who, um, what organizations we work with. Um, we'll talk a little bit about where we would be doing this event today, which is at Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, also uh, known as Wakan Teepee, which is uh, in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, this sacred cave site uh, called Wakan Teepee, and that means dwelling place of the sacred. We really consider kind of that whole area, including the burial mounds above at Indian Mounds Regional Park as Wakan Teepee. So that whole site is sacred. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, that site and that's where we would be today. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the history, how to get there, um, just to um, orient people a little bit. Um, this upper left hand photo is um, a Seth Eastman painting from 1846 that shows the Kaposia village area a little bit about what this terrain looked like prior to colonization. Um, before European contact, this area was a vibrant floodplain on the Mississippi River. I'm kind of reading some notes here, so if you see me looking down. But the, um, the confluence of tributaries at this bend in the river um, is known as Imanijaska, which means white bluffs in the Dakota language. So this whole area of St. Paul, you can see that those white um, bluffs, the, the cliff uh, faces, and that um, is why this area was known to Dakota people as Imanijaska. And this really provided such a great um, place for Dakota people to make their homes. Uh, there was everything that people needed here. Two significant sites in the landscape, Wakon Teepee and in Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary and the burial mounds above at Indian Mounds Regional Park along the bluff. Um, at one time, there were more than 40 documented mounds at Indian Mounds Regional Park. Now there are only six that are left intact and that are visible. Um, some, of those, some of those mounds were um, plowed to level the ground, plowed over to level the ground. Some were filled in, um, but nonetheless, there are a lot of burial remains still on that entire stretch of that bluff overlooking the river. Um, the activities here have been exten extensively documented in the historical record and especially by the journals of Jonathan Carver who lived among the Dakota people between 1766 and 1767 when he lived there um, for about six months over the winter. And so um, he describes these beautiful landscapes and the extensive petroglyphs that were in the cave at Wakan Teepee um, that speaks to really the holiness of the site. The image on the far uh, right, upper right, is a Star Tribune photo of the rail yard in 1958. And that just kind of shows what happened in that 100 years between when Seth Eastman visited the site and painted this photo, uh, painted this painting of what the area looks like, and then what happened um, uh, in a, such a short amount of time, 100 years later, um, at, at the site. So it was, uh, the face of Wakan Tipi, the, the atrium at the entrance of the cave was blasted with dynamite to make room for the railroad. And it was a heavily industrialized um, area used for railway. There were um, gas manufacturing plant down there. There was a brewery. Uh, there was a lot of industrial uses on this site. Uh, for about a hundred years or so. And then in the 1970s, um, ultimately a lot of that industry was abandoned. The land being <clears throat> heavily polluted and contaminated um, was left and became kind of a, a makeshift unofficial dump for the city of St. Paul. And, um, and people would bring their trash down there, um, sofas, refrigerators, things like that. Um, still, these natural springs that were coming out of the, the bluffs um, were still, you know, producing water um, that was just on, um, there, there was nowhere for it to go. It was just kind of coming out wherever it came out. But it was in 1997 that a group of um, community environmental activists came together and wanted to reclaim that land and uh, return it to a, a natural space. And um, that was Lower Failing Creek Project. So that's how our organization got its start. We really worked, we partnered with a lot of people, including the city of St. Paul and the Trust for Public Land and uh, other local community groups to ultimately remove 50 tons of trash from the site, 
more than 13 tons of contaminated soil from the site. And then we worked with um, primarily Hmong youth um, through Urban Roots uh, who are volunteers to plant and restore this area. So now we have this beautiful 27 acre nature sanctuary that has a lot of culturally significant history and meaning. And um, also part of the Mississippi Flyway, um, really just a, a really great place to, to look for um, birds. So uh, let me get to my notes there because I've just been winging it here a little bit, but Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary is part of a designated important bird area. So that's by the Audubon Society. And this important bird area is called the Mississippi River Twin Cities IBA. And um, so the Mississippi River IBA is adjacent and the adjacent floodplain forests and uplands extending for about 38 miles of the river from Minneapolis down to Hastings. So that's Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary is part of that important bird area. Um, it's situated along this migratory corridor, the Mississippi Flyway, um, where about 40% of North America's waterfowl use this migratory path. Um, so it's a, it's a really um, beautiful site. There are a lot of opportunities to see a variety of birds here from waterfowl to warblers to your winter residents. Um, so if you wanna to move to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about how to get there and you can kind of see a map. Um, I put some directions on here for those of you who aren't familiar, um, how to get there from 94 east or west but you can kind of see the red lines, <clears throat> um, which I, I mean, I'm not sure how big you can see this on your screen, but I tried to kind of show, it's like when you're on Mounds Boulevard, you're getting off 94 and you're heading towards like Mounds Park. A lot of people don't notice that, that right-hand turn on Commercial Street, um, but it's right before you get into Mounds Park, there's, there's a little road called Commercial Street. If you take a right there, it kind of switches you around and you go back down a hill and then you come, you come around to um, a little parking lot and um, you're underneath then the third street, uh, Kellogg Street Bridge on the east side, Lower Town, where, where the east side meets Lower Town. And so you park there, you walk under the bridge and it opens up to this gorgeous nature sanctuary. So there are plenty of trails and I highlighted some of the some of the main kind of spots within the nature sanctuary. But um, when, you, when you walk in, you can kind of see that purple arrow is the, you know, where you walk into the nature sanctuary. And um, when you walk along the path, uh, the whole loop um, takes is about two miles. But when you get to this first cave is where the orange star is. And the first, uh, cave is called Brewer's Cave. There's like these iron wrought um, fence in front of the cave and there's a freshwater spring that comes out of that cave and that is a really really great birding spot in the nature sanctuary because of that open water and the springs that are there um, and it's right kind of on this little um, bluff face. There's a lot of tree coverage right there so there's a lot of places for birds to perch and you know go down to get some water and Look for food, um, but that's a really, really great spot for uh, looking at birds in this nature sanctuary. If you go all the way down the trails to the very end of the loop, that's where that yellow star is, and that is uh, the Wakantipi Cave site, um, where the the cave creates this um, large spring-fed pond. And that site in the winter is great for seeing, especially mallards. We all love mallards. They're, um, they're here all the time, but it's just such a cool spot to see them kind of up close because it's a smaller, smallish pond. And there are, I've counted upwards of 150 mallards there in the winter time. It's a great, great spot to see a lot of them and just watch their activities. Um, and there are other birds um, back there as well, of course. And then the white star, when you're on your way back, so you come, you come down to the yellow star, make a loop around, and then you're on your way back, there's a stand of cottonwood trees. 
And that is, um, we have one pair of nesting bald eagles in the nature sanctuary, and that's where their eagle's nest is. So that's a little bit about, um, a little bit about the site itself. Um, when you, when you get there, um, a couple of things to know about the terrain, it's, um, it's not paved. It's, uh, you know, uh, natural kind of, um, rock trails. And so, and there are some areas on the trail that do get wet from springs that just pop up here and there throughout the sanctuary. So it's good to wear, um, boots that you can kind of get wet or a little bit uh, muddy. And also, um, something that, you know, hopefully you won't slip. So there are these great things called yak tracks that you can stick on the bottom of your shoes and help you um, not slip on ice. So I think those are really good for getting out there when you're birding and some of these different um, areas that may be a little bit less maintained. Um, so the city of St. Paul doesn't come through and salt these paths or, you know, anything like that during the, during the winter. So um, something like that would be really good um, to help, especially in the winter. Um, obviously, I got my Carhartt hat here. You want to wear a hat. You want to wear gloves. You want to dress warm because um, the last thing you want to do when you're out birding is um, be worried about that your fingers are too cold or your ears are cold and you just want to try to have fun looking at birds. So um, just try to make sure that you have um, some good layers on and your yak tracks possibly on the bottom of your uh, hiking shoes. And that's pretty much the the gear that you'll need to go out to go out birding. There are um, um, binoculars are always helpful, um, but can also be kind of an accessibility issue. Some people might not have binoculars or know where to get them uh, or, you know, not sure if they want to invest that much money in this activity before they, you know, get a chance to get a little bit. So um, St. Paul Public Libraries has a lot of um, opportunities at different sites to check out these nature backpacks. And in those nature backpacks, there are two pair of binoculars per backpack. So that's a really great opportunity to get, get some experience and check out using binoculars before you maybe make the commitment to invest in a pair for yourself. Uh, but like uh, Sam, Sam likes to say, you can use just your eyeballs and your earballs to get out there and listen for birds and you know, try to check them out. Um, it's just, uh, there's so much to learn. And like I said, I'm a new birder. So I thought, you know, uh, gosh, I don't, I can't tell a part of a sparrow from a chickadee. I don't know what, you know, I don't know the difference. Between, I didn't know the difference between anything, but it was really fun um, getting out there and being able to just kind of little by little, you start learning things. So um I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. We'll have some time to Q&A at the end. But um, Sam, if you want to move to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, here from Monica Maureen about some of the birds you can find at, at this site. Thanks, Maggie, um, for introducing us to the area and um, telling us about the, the rich history. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about winter birding, um, specifically at Walk on TV, Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, and then just about winter birding in general. Um, some of the photos that you're going to see and videos that you're going to see are, are from this site, and then some are just pictures of birds in winter um, that have been taken in Minnesota. And as Monica mentioned, um, she does photography, so a lot of the pictures are hers and some of them are mine. Um, in this slide, that bald eagle is actually was taken um, at Bruce Vento. So that is one of the pair of the nesting bald eagles. And we did see um, both of them yesterday. Um, and I just took some pictures of the water um, just because it's such an, an essential part of the site. You know, there's the creek. And as Maggie was mentioning, um, there's the freshwater springs, which is one of the big reasons why um, we get a lot of, of wildlife there. And it's really cool because the, the water is open and moving and um, which draws a lot of wildlife activity. You can go to the next slide. Um, so that's the, a picture of the where Maggie was talking about where you would enter. Um, kind of the parking lot is underneath that overpass and um, 
And then the picture on the right is just one of the fruiting trees. And so in the winter, a lot of the birds that you'll see um, will be drawn to places where there's food sources. Um, so you can always keep your eyes peeled for things that birds might want to eat. Um, so I think that's a crab apple um, tree right there, which we have all over the Twin Cities. And so the first group of birds that we're going to talk about are your passerines or your songbirds. Um, and so these are the ones that a lot of people when you're getting introduced to birding that you might hear the most about. Um, and so the bird that we saw the most during our count was rock pigeons. We counted 158 yesterday. Um, so that is a super common urban bird and you'll find throughout um, North America and around the world. And on the left, that's an American goldfinch. Um, that one is a male in his um, breeding plumage. And so if you see goldfinches right now, both in the ma male and female are gonna be much more drab, kind of a grayish brown color with a, li a little bit of yellow. Would you say Monica? Yeah, just a little. Yep. You can go to the next slide. Um, and then Monica, do you just want to switch back and forth between the sure. birds? Sure, yeah. So um, these are birds that are gonna um, hang around uh, most of, most year round. So the black uh, cap chickadee is one of my favorites. Um, you know, they do the chickadee dee dee uh, song. So they're around all year. The American crow um, stays around. We counted some of those yesterday. And then people always think that the American robin um, migrate. Um, but it's been, uh, you know, maybe like, you know, the last decade or so, um, a lot more are actually staying. So um, you can see robins down there um, this time of year as well. Um, uh, go ahead, Maureen. No, okay. no. Um, so in this next slide, we've got um, the blue jay and so that is a bird that you will see um, year round in Minnesota. Um, and if you hear a loud kind of squawking, harsh noise, that's probably a blue jay. And they are very territorial and very aggressive. Um, and usually you'll see them up in trees and they're pretty social, you'll see them in groups. The dark-eyed junco, which is in the middle, um, that's a bird that comes and joins us um, in the fall through the winter. And they are super social. You'll always see them in groups. Often you'll see them on the ground and in bushes in a group foraging um, for different types of seeds that they can find. Um, and then on the right is um, one of my favorites and a, and a bird that we see year round here in Minnesota, the Northern Cardinal. And so on the right side, the red one that is the male and on the left side, that's the female. Um, and so this is a type of bird, many species, the male and the female will have um, different types of plumages and you'll already see them in the winter paired up um, getting ready to um, breed and nest in the spring. Yeah, so then uh, this is a, a white breasted nuthatch and in, in the winter and usually in the fall, um, the migration, during the migration, you'll also get a red breasted nuthatch, but the white breasted is here year round. Um, the red bellied woodpecker, um, there's lots of woodpeckers that are you know, stay in, stay in uh, the Twin Cities all year round. So the red-bellied woodpecker, um, this pileated woodpecker, which um, we actually took um, a few weeks ago down, um, uh, down at the sanctuary. And then we have, uh, I think we'll show the others. Um, I think there's pictures of the other woodpeckers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So in this next slide, um, on the left is the hairy woodpecker and on the right is the downy woodpecker. And these are probably, the downy woodpecker is probably the most common that you'll see in the Twin Cities. And you'll notice that it looks very similar to the hairy woodpecker. Um, they have pretty similar field marks. The main difference is the hairy woodpecker is physically usually a little bit larger um, on an individual basis. And its um, beak is much um, longer in proportion to the size of its head. Um, and th this group of birds, the nuthatches and the woodpeckers, um, you're going to see them most often um, on trees, on the trunks, and on the limbs. Um, and for a woodpecker, you'll kind of see it maybe like spiral around and go up. 
and a, a nut hatch often you'll see it going down and what they're doing is they're foraging for insects that um, are either um, inside of the tree or underneath the bark. And so something that you can look for when you're out on a walk um, is for evidence of these types of birds. If you see trees where there's like big holes and it looks like something has been digging into the tree, it's probably from one of these types of woodpeckers or nut hatches. And the, Sam, can you go back one slide? So the one on the right, the pileated woodpecker, um, is one of my favorites, and um, we did see one at Bruce Vento a couple weeks ago. Um, and that this type of bird is um, it does a cavity nest, and so if you ever see like a a, a really big hole in the spring, that's kind of a, if you get to find one of these when they're nesting, it's a treat, and you should go back and try to see it as it um, nests and and has babies. So they they're kind of cool. They make this big. They'll just dig a big hole into the trunk of a tree to make their nest. Yeah, and I just want to point out, um, this is a female pileated um, because there's no red uh, by her beak. And then if you go to the next slide, um, so the the one on the left, the hairy, that is a female hairy. Um, she has no red on her head. And um, so the, the male hairy would have the red. And for the downy, this is a male downy and the female downy would have no red on her head. So Lorene, you took this video, so I'll let you talk about it. Sure, um, so one thing that we've been doing um, during COVID is trying to take pictures and take videos to um, share birding and bird walks with folks um, since we know that at this time, not everyone is able to um, get outside. Um, and so this is just a short clip of um, the mallards that are currently living um, in that big pond that Maggie was talking about in the nature sanctuary. And we have in front of us a group of male and female mallards. This is a species of dabbling duck that is very common in Minnesota and you will see here year round. And since they are dabbling ducks that like to feed on the surface of the water, in the winter you will find them in lakes and ponds where the water is still open and not frozen over. We can go to the um, next slide, thanks. And we have in front of us. A so um, in, in the Twin Cities, uh, you know, where there are open lakes, um, you will see Canada geese. Again, a lot of them migrate, but then there are a lot that stay here if they can find um, food sources and open water. And then trumpeter swans are, are another common bird that will stay around if, in the open water. And with the mallards, um, we also have some wood ducks that will actually stay around. So if, you're, if you see mallards, um, always look for that, those wood ducks that are hanging out with them. Um, and so the other type of bird that you can keep your um, eyes and ears open for when you're out on a walk are raptors. And so the American bald eagle is um, a very, very common um, bird of prey that you will see in Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, and so there are some that do a north to south migration um, in the fall um, and go to warmer climates. And then we have a resident population that lives here um, in the Twin Cities and beyond and um, are, are permanent. Um, and there is a nesting site. Um, there's a really big nest in that, co that stand of cottonwoods. And so um, at any given day, I think you could probably go to the nature sanctuary at any, at any point in the year and you'll probably see them. Um, so with the bald eagles, you'll see them flying, soaring above, up above you or they're perched in trees. Um, and then the other place in the Twin Cities that you'll see them in the winter is they like to perch on lake ice and river ice and they'll just kind of hang out and then they'll wait for something that they, somebody else has caught or that they're trying to prey upon. And bald eagles are not very good hunters um, and they kind of just take advantage of other predatory animals and whatever comes across their way. Um, and they do, they do prey on like, you'll see them sitting on lake ice trying to get at like next to a flock of ducks 
and they'll try to get catch like a mallard or something like that. Um, and these pictures, the one on the left is an adult. So when they reach four years, that's they've reached adulthood. And that's the kind of the typical presentation that you would see with the white head and the brown body. On the right side is a juvenile. And so they take four years to get to adulthood. And so every year their plumage changes a little bit. So if you see a bird that looks like a bald eagle, but maybe is brown and kind of white and streaky, it's probably a bald eagle, but it's juvenile. So then a couple other raptors um, that you'll see. Um, so the red-tailed hawk is, um, if you're driving down the freeway, it's probably a red-tailed hawk that you're seeing sitting there. Um, watching the cars go by. Um, not all the time, but uh, the majority of the time. And then the other hawks that um, tend to stay around in the winter are the Cooper's hawk and sometimes the sharp shin, sometimes the sharp shin uh, migrate, but the Cooper's hawk um, will be around in the winter too. And, and they're looking for mostly mice and other um, rodents that are, are in, in the sanctuary or on the side of the road. Yeah, I would I would add that since the um, that the same nature sanctuary has a really big open um, grass um, kind of prairie ish area, um, you'll, that's kind of a great hunting ground for them too. Like raptors often like open fields where they can perch and just kind of scan for little rodents to eat. And while while I was there at Bruce Vento, maybe this was a few days ago, I did see a red tail hawk, and I I often see red tail hawks soaring. Um, through the airspace of the sanctuary, but I had a chance to see a red-tailed hawk perched and they were looking kind of over that mm -hmm. uh, prairie area, you know, waiting to see a, a mouse or a vole or somebody that they were gonna have uh, dinner. So it's like, you know, always wanna, when you're birding, you know, look up and look at those um, uh, street lights. And, you know, that's when I first started birding, one of the things I I really liked doing was looking when I was driving down the freeway, like Monica said, looking at the street lights and, and there's, you're always going to see those red tail hawks sitting up there. It's really fun to just start spotting birds that way in the urban area. All right, I think we can move to the next slide. And so Melissa is going to tell us about um, the Christmas bird count. Yeah, so this is a new and exciting topic that I like to talk about. Um, uh, like many things, um, the Christmas bird count has a long history, um, 120 years of it. Um, so originally the Christmas bird count was a sport event uh, where people would go out um, on Christmas and kill the most birds. And whoever did that would win the game. However, um, a ornithologist, which is a long word for a bird scientist, uh, named Frank Chapman, became concerned with the declining population of birds, for good reason, and organized something called the Bird Census in 1900. So if you could think about nowadays when we're having this chat via Zoom and organizing on Facebook and things like that, um, he got together 20, well, 27 individuals, including himself, um, to host a count where they live. So um, Toronto to Texas to Florida, uh, Maine um, to California. So there in 1900, um, on Christmas Day, they organized a count um, to go out and count the birds that they see. So in total, they did 18 1,500 birds, uh, 89 species, uh, 25 counts total. Um, so a significant um, kind of start of history. Um, from then on, um, there has always been a Christmas bird census. Um, now translating the old count to the new count, we have the Christmas bird count where we don't go out um, and use this day as a sport or this time frame as a sport, but an actual census um, citizen science project. So when I say citizen science, what is it and why is it important? So citizen science at its um, basic definition is scientific research conducted in whole or in part 
by amateurs or non-professionals. And I would argue a little bit there that a lot of folks who do participate in the Christmas bird count um, and citizen science projects are professionals and are experts. Um, but the Christmas bird count is this time frame uh, ranging from December 14th through January 1st. Um, it originally only happened in the Americas, so North America um, uh, area but it's now expanded worldwide. Um, our Christmas bird count in North America um, is hosted by the Audubon Society. Um, not all countries, not all continents have a similar structure, but they are hosted by um, bird enthusiasts, hobbyists, um, uh, naturalists, scientists, things like that. So why is it important? So citizen science and the Christmas bird count has really um, made way for many things um, in current times. So one of them is environmental awareness. We talk about the Laurel Trail and Creek Project, and we talk about environmental education, um, stewardship, um, you know, gaining information about the land and the history. Well, environmental awareness. Um, what it really allows um, us to do is think of um, not just our population, but the whole population of birds, of wildlife. Um, in 2014, the Audubon Society um, created the first of its kind, a comprehensive approach, a comprehensive report, sorry, that predicted that 588 species of North American birds were, are being affected by climate change. So think about it, not too long ago, six years ago, Audubon said, all this data we've been collecting for a century, we're gonna compile it and make some, some predictions about what's going on with our bird population. Um, in, in this report, they found that there are critical landscapes that are being lost to drilling, development, um, changing climate, that it impacts not only the wildlife, but people in large numbers. So citizen, citizen science and um, the Christmas bird count has allowed for this large gathering of data um, to create these trends and um, kind of give us a picture of what's going on in the environment. Um, another huge component of citizen science um, and kind of where the Christmas bird count has played a huge role is to monitor species decline and create protections. Um, we, you know, we talk a lot about the bald eagle and how common it is and, um, you know, how it's, it's great to see one. And, you know, some people are like, wow, you know, there's just so many. But I'm certain that many of us have heard the tale of when bald eagles were a rare sight to see. And I think that's something that we we're starting to lose that that feeling of endangered because we see so many of them. But there are three well documented times where the bald eagle showed incredible decline um, in the 1800s. Um, and if you think about it, you know the Christmas bird count was going on, and that was where you went out and and got as many birds, and you won this game, and there really wasn't any reason to besides a sport event. Um, so in the 1800s, um, they started to notice a decline in waterfowl, shorebirds, and other prey that the bald eagle might rely on to, to be sustained. Um, in the 1940s, after World War II, um, this chemical called DDT was being used to kill insects and mosquitoes on lawns, um, but that was being washed into waterways um, and really causing an issue for um, nesting bald eagles. Um, and then in 1963, they found that only 487 nesting pairs existed in North America. So a huge, huge hit to this, um, to this bird. Um, but observation coupled with protection allowed this bird to make a comeback. Um, we now have almost 10,000 nesting pairs in North America today. 
So you can see the importance of something like citizen science, observations, protections, awareness can do for um, a species like the bald eagle and you know, like other um, birds that are on the decline. Uh, further studies and investigations um, in citizen science. So um, one of the ones that I'll talk about is uh, the state of birds. So the last report was out in um, 2019. And what they found um, using um, the Christmas bird count data, um, so coupled with other investigations and studies, um, was that forest birds had a 22% decline since 1970, shorebirds 37% since 1970, and grasslands has taken the biggest hit at 53% since 1970. So as you can see, um, you know, significant loss for bird populations. Um, and when we talk about birds, we also have to talk about um, ourselves as humans, um, because we're, we're all related. We all t um, tend to this land. We all are participating here together. So um, citizen science and um, this, this, what this can do for us is really bring us to attention that um, the harm we're causing to our relatives, right? Whether they're people or wildlife or animals or plants or things like that. So. Um, these types of studies um, support efforts worldwide and organized by, are organized by different groups um, as an effort to track and monitor, you know, what the trends are going on. So um, the EPA also uses um, Christmas bird count data and um, other citizen science projects um, to report on climate change. So these are huge, huge um, uh, efforts by, you know, hobbyists, families, kids, naturalists, um, thousands of people that come together um, to participate in this type of project. So um, I'm going to let Sam play a video. Um, it's about uh, four minutes, and I know we're coming to the end of our time, um, but I think it's, it's a good video to um, um, really show um, some things like community and passion um, information and exploration in the Christmas bird count. born in Normandy, right across from the English Channel, very close to all the beaches where the D-Day happened. A lot of my relatives or friends were fishermen. And when they didn't have uh, the weather forecast, there was no satellites, no maps. What was interesting is people rely on birds for the direction of the wind, so they use the wisdom of the birds. It's interesting. Two black vultures and one caracara together. Say it. Two black vultures and one caracara together. Oh, how funny. Four, five, six. They're really big. There are teams that have children. How many species we have so far? There are times when people sit at the bird feeder all day in their backyard. Black vultures, five. Turkey vultures, 40. Everybody who sees a bird that day within a circle, that counts. Crested caracara, six. And I think what's important is to know that there are thousands of people who are doing the same thing on the same day. Red-shouldered hawk, one. Red-tailed hawk, seven. Song. Crested caracara, six. Black-bellied plover, four. White-throated. Yes. white crown. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the 20th 
anniversary of the Mad Island, Matagorda County Christmas bird count. Thank you. Thank you. You're part of something much bigger. It goes from so many states, so many countries. I think that's what's amazing. Collected still. Yes. Yes. Scratch it all, Yes. Yes. Belted yes. kingfisher. Yes. Red belly. Yes. There are people who keep life lists. A thousand birds, two thousand birds, five thousand birds. I have my yes. book and on this picture I write when I see the bird for the first time. You can go ahead and stop it. All right. Um, so that video was from the Audubon Society um, website. Um, so I encourage um, anyone uh, to go on there and continue and watch um, several videos that they have. And, you know, although that's in Texas, I thought, uh, you know, why not so show us a little bit of sunshine today. Um, uh, but but what I what I see there, there's there's things I see and there's things I don't see. Um, but you know, there's there's tons of community around um, not only Christmas bird counts but birding um, and the passion uh, for folks to keep life lists and 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 I think it ranges. So there's people that keep life lists and then there's people who are backyard birders and you know acknowledge and see. Uh, what's in their backyard or around them or, you know, put up bird feeders because that's just what they do. But, you know, it really is bringing um, awareness and um, kind of kind of creating a culture um, and atmosphere for, for these bit birds to live in. Um, I, I do have to say one thing I do notice, um, and I would probably um, well, one thing that I do notice is the lack of diversity. Um, and I wanted to bring that up here because um, our Christmas bird count looks a lot different uh, in Minnesota because you're dealing with snow or rain or water, or whatnot. Um, but our mission in the Urban Bird Collective is um, to not only encourage um, BIPOC folks and the LGBT community, um, but to bring new birders along, people who are enthusiasts, people who are um, uh, outdoors uh, individuals and just bring attention to um, um, kind of to this realm, I would say. So if you wanna move to the next slide. Yeah, so I think the three of us are gonna talk about um, our count, um, but we did do a count on Christmas day and um, many of the birds, um, if not all the birds uh, that we, that Lorene and Monica talked about, um, uh, we found on um, Christmas day, on our Christmas bird count. Um, these lists can be larger, these, these lists can be smaller based on um, many factors, so weather conditions, and you can see it was, it was 10 degrees, but it was sunny, there was a little bit of wind, um, it was, you know, a little over 24 hours after a huge blizzard. So, you know, the birds, the birds are, are kind of doing their thing, and and um, what we observed are what what we were kind of expected to see. Um, yeah, and it, did Lorraine or Monica want to say anything else about our count? Yeah, so um, Sam, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, real quick, I wasn't at this, you, I wasn't participating in this bird count, but I did participate in, um, uh, oh gee, what's it called? It, it was put on by the University of Minnesota um, and it was like an urban and migratory bird um, institute. And in that, uh, it was like a three-day program and people who were black, indigenous, people of color, um, you can you can apply for a scholarship to attend this. And, I, and I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but it was grant funded um, and they're gonna continue to try to do it every year, but um, something to keep an eye on um, if they do it again. But it was, I was able to get a scholarship and participate and it was a three-day institute and um, one of the things they talked about was how to do 
uh, bird count. And really there's two, two different ways to do it. You can do a station or what they call a stationary bird count, or you can do a walking or um, traveling bird count. And so um, Melissa, I don't know if you wanna talk about the difference between those two types of counts and I'm assuming you guys did a walking count. Yep, we, we did do a walking count. Um, and uh, the, kind of the sitting counts is, um, is kind of what you saw and or heard in that video um, is you can um, be in one location, whether it's your backyard um, or uh, monitoring a bird feeder um, and, and just picking one location. Um, those, those numbers, these numbers um, do feed into a larger regional um, database uh, for, for Christmas bird count. So although we only did Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary, um, this is, these numbers will be added to a larger section um, of account. So this was a walking one. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see um, our walking outfits. So, you know, it was a cold day. Um, these are the paths, you know, they were snow filled. Um, and, um, you know, we were dressed warm and um, it was a walking, so we did do a loop. We went to a little bit past the pond where you saw the mallards. Um, and then looped ourselves um, back uh, to the parking lot. Um, so it's a nice, it's a nice walk um, in the winter, in the spring, um, any time of year. Um, and and it was accessible uh, for us to do a walking, a walking count. And then kind of one of the things that's a difference between a walking count and a stationary or sitting count is if you're doing a sitting count, you have to kind of like have some parameters in your field of vision. And you say, I'm only gonna count birds that are in this area. And when you're doing a walking count, it's anything that you see around you. So if you can see it, if it's flying through or, um, or if it's you know, 100, you know, 100 feet away, but you can see it, um, it's, as long as you can see it, you can add it to your count. The other thing about doing a bird count is that you want to make sure that you're not double counting birds. So you really only um, count the birds that you see uh, that you can identify that you know that there's a multiple. So if you see one downy woodpecker when you first enter the sanctuary um, on, on a cottonwood and then you're um, halfway you know, through the nature sanctuary and you see another downy woodpecker separately, um, you know, Five, 10 minutes later, you don't, you wouldn't count it again because you don't know if it's the same one or not. Um, if you see two downy woodpeckers together, then you count two. Um, so that's kind of uh, another thing about how to do these counts so that you keep it um, as accurate as possible because it is feeding into this larger scientific um, for people to use the data. Um, there's another uh, count that a lot of people can participate in. Christmas bird count can be a little bit, um, you have to like join a group and um, it's kind of more difficult, I guess, to kind of get into those groups um, to participate in this uh, larger Christmas bird count. But there's other bird counts that you can participate in like the Cornell um, Backyard Feeder Watch. And you set up a bird feeder in your yard or on your deck or wherever you're at and you uh, pick a day and a time every week that you're going to watch that bird feeder and then you just uh, record who visits the feeder and that's a stationary count so you only are counting the birds that are visiting your feeder if you see a really cool bird fly right past your feeder you can't count it so there's those are kind of the the rules i guess uh, a little bit of the rules about um counts i don't know monica if you wanted yeah, to add that. yeah maggie i would say um Yes, it, the bird counts, the bird community can be kind of clicky. And what we're trying to do at the Urban Bird Collective is actually change that. And so we we're very fortunate. We have some designated areas specifically for the Urban Bird Collective. And so unfortunately, this was pandemic year, but next year we hope to open it up to a bunch uh, more birders, people who are just learning. They can come with us and learn and do this count. Um, we, as the Urban Bird Collective, are also participating in I want to say like five to six different counts. And so we as Urban Bird Collective will go up in pairs um, or three. And so we're we're creating our own community within the Christmas bird count. Um, yeah. And we hope to do more of that. 
Yes, and that's a great point. And that's why it's so great to have this Urban Bird Collective because uh, yeah, prior to linking up with you guys, it's like, who do I contact? How do I get involved? How do I, get, how do I be a part of this? And so, um, so this is one great entry point for those of you who are on this call and wanna learn more about how, it's really, really fun. And um, I don't know, uh, so, some people think it's kind of nerdy that I, I really like doing these things, but I just think it's so fun. And it's literally like um, that game, Pokemon Go. You know, but you're out in the real world and you're like looking for these cool birds. And when you find, uh, especially when you find a species that you're really looking for. So right now um, there's a species of winter bird that I am on the, on the lookout for, which is a Northern Shrike. And um, uh, I, I found some evidence of a Shrike when I was at Carpenter Nature Center the other day um, about, uh, you know, the way that they hunt, but I didn't actually see one. So it's, um, it's always fun to try to get out there and see, oh, I want to see this kind of bird today. But then sometimes you get surprised and you see something you really weren't expecting. Like the other day, Monica saw a mountain bluebird at Como, right? Yep. So it's just really, uh, really fun, uh, to do. So anyways, I, I'll, I'll stop talking now and I, uh, taking up your, your presentation time, <laughs> but I think we're getting close to the Q and A now. Yeah. We are actually upon the Q and A and discussion point, unless any of our presenters have a thought they would like to share based on what we were just talking about. Okay, I'm gonna move us along to our next slide, which uh, is, is really, we have some questions pulled up on the screen here, but this is really uh, an open moment for uh, really for the audience members too. Um, if you would like to unmute yourselves or even write a question in the chat, whether that's a question for our presenters or something you would like to share, uh, we would love for this to be a, a good space. And I wanted to mention too, if people are feeling shy, that you can find uh, the answers to these first four questions from all four of our presenters on Lower Fallon Creek Project's December 8th blog. Sure, I'll share. Hi, I'm Tess. Um, actually, Monica and I got interested in birding together. We were on a um, summer vacation trip. Um, I think we were at, Monica, where were we? Uh, yes, lake sir. Ozark, Lake of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. Right, it was a man-made lake um, down south. And I was out walking by myself and I saw a red-headed woodpecker on the top of a um, telephone pole and it just got me interested in the beauty of what that bird was like and wanted to learn more. So that kind of is where I started and Monica has pursued it a little bit, well, quite a bit more than I have. So I'm kind of the helper in um, all of our adventures. And um, we take our poochies and um, Lorene and Monica mainly um, learn about birds in the area and they come back and share the stories. But um, it's amazing and I love getting out in nature and um, thank you for this presentation. It was amazing. I would like to um, just share a story that I actually ha had it shared before um, about where my journey began because I think, um, you know, as Maggie had said, starting, starting birding, it's exciting. <clears throat> um, and everybody kind of is, is, you know, starts in different places. But um, I would say more than like six, almost seven years ago, um, uh, newly, newly, newly in the dating world, um, was dating this guy. I was out visiting him in Burnsville, Minnesota, and we were walking um, on this like little pond um, boardwalk area. And I, and I should say, my husband is on this call and he doesn't know this story. Um, <laughs> uh, but the guy I was dating at the time, he said, oh, a mallard. And I'm like, what's a mallard? <laughs> and um, he's like, are you serious? And I'm like, yeah, uh, I don't know what that is. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't that long ago where I didn't even know what a mallard was. Um, and here I am, you know, many years later, um, and see, you know, 78 in one day, and it's still equally as exciting, but it, it brings me back to that moment where I, I, the humble beginning of not even knowing what a mallard was. 
and it's one of those birds that is most common, uh, fairly easy to, um, to identify. And so anybody here on this call that um, maybe knows what a mallard is, then you're, you're one step closer to being um, a passionate, uh, excellent birder. So thought I'd just share that for anybody who, you know, might might know a couple of birds but are feeling hesitant. Um, <laughs> can't be as bad as I was. <laughs> I agree so much. There was that point for me too, and it was my current husband who, you know, every time we drive down the freeway, he, oh, there's a red red tail hawk, or oh, there's a turkey vulture and I'm like I don't know what you're seeing how are you seeing these birds how are you knowing who they are so it was the same experience for me I just um, had no idea what I was looking at and also like how to see birds I you know he would he would be like oh look over there there's a there's a group of uh whatever uh cedar wax wings in that tree and I'm like where I don't see anything you know <laughs> it's just like developing that um, vision, the scent, you know, to be able to see the birds in their environment because um, they are, um, you know, their coloring is to hide themselves. And, um, and so developing that vision, it was, it was kind of a work in progress for me, but I, I can there now. And now I'm the one that's saying like, oh, look over there, I can see this. And everybody's like, where, what? <laughs> Take some time, but you'll get there. I have a question here which is uh, what tools do you all recommend for tracking? And specifically, uh, any tips you might have on identifying birds by sound? Yes, yes, I love this question. Um, my favorite tool is, I don't know if you guys can see this app window, but this is my Audubon app right here. Um, and if you download it, it's free to download. And you can look and um, you can search the guide by sight, sound, colors, the shape of the bird, the size of the bird. Um, it will give you results based on where you are and what time of the year it is, like what's most likely it is that you're seeing. If you put in like, well, it was black and brown and it was perched and it was about the size of a crow, you know, uh, then it will give you, well, here's what it could have been. And then you can... Um, play it, it has audio of all their different calls so you can play it and then that that this app really helps me identify birds um, that I see uh, as a new birder um, because a lot of times I mean I don't have somebody like Monica with me uh, when I'm out birding all the time um, to help me along so it's like having uh, Monica in my pocket <laughs> with this app so it's pretty great. And I just want to say, though, that, you know, I've been birding for 20 years and um, I'm still learning. And every spring I'm like, what is that? And then and then it comes back. Um, the other thing I do is I actually practice, you know, I have an app, too, um, like yours, very similar. Um, it's uh, oh, my God, I can't even. It's the iBird. iBird. Thank you. iBird Pro. And I actually practice my spring calls just to, you know, get them back in my head so that when I'm out there, then it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is I'm still learning calls. Um, a bird doesn't have just one call. So, you know, it, you think, oh, I got that one down. And then you find out that it has five other calls. Um, but what I do is each year I try to master, you know, a few more calls. Um, and again, I still have to practice them when I go out every spring, or maybe these are migrants that come in the fall. Um, and so we don't hear them very often. So it's like, it takes me a while to like, oh yeah, that's what it is. And I kind of like, go, oh, oh. And then the other thing is um, you have to make sure that you know what a squirrel sounds like, um, because <laughs> you will think that that's a rare bird. And then all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, it's just a squirrel. Just a red squirrel. Just a red squirrel. <laughs> And the, and the blue jays, the blue jays um, can mimic sounds. So, um, but they're a fairly large bird, and so usually when it's like, mm, that's something different, you know, they fly in. You're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, the blue jays are interesting. They have a variety of different sounds that don't really sound like each other. So it can be hard to remember all the sounds that they make. Yeah. 
I think, but the one, you know, what you, again, just really talking about, you know, the time of a year that you're going, if you look at the place you're going and look at the list of birds that are likely in that area, um, again, then I, I get those sounds in my head. And then when I hear them and I'm looking for them, that's much easier. Um, and again, just listening to them, just practicing. Um, the, the thing coming up that is really hard for me is the warblers. Um, so they're going to be coming in, you know, April, May, and, you know, there's 20, 25, 30 of them and just getting those calls down um, is really helpful. I just wanted to, so was the, the question, what do you have, what, what are like your key things that you take with you birding or was it specifically just about sound? You know, I think it was both. So interpret it however, however it makes sense to you. I think we're looking for all input. Yeah, everything's been helpful. Yeah, um, well, I guess I just want to come back to the what someone one of you had mentioned earlier about um, St. Paul Public Library's Nature Smart program. Um, and I think if you're new to birding and you want to um, get some experience with some binoculars and you want to try using some um, before you decide whether or not to, you know, spend $100 and invest in a pair. Um, I think that's a really great program. And so I love bird watching because you basically can do it anywhere in the city, at a state park, wherever you are, and you just need yourself. And if you have a pair of binoculars, I would say that is, you know, another, a really helpful tool um, to help you um, see things at a further distance and, and pinpoint them. Um, but it's all about just um, using your using your insights and your observations. And so what do you hear? What do you see? Um, and as someone who has been doing, you know, birding for a couple of years now, and I'm constantly trying to build my bird ID skills, um, just like knowing that like, yeah, you have to think about where, where you are, what time of year it is, how the bird is moving, you know, is it in the sky, is it in the tree, is it in water? And so you're taking all these different cues of information which can help you ID or say like, this is the most likely thing that this bird would be based on what I'm seeing or what I'm hearing or how it's moving. I have a terrible ear. I, I'm not very good at recognizing by sound. So I try to do what Monica does, which is listen to the calls and help me remember them. Um, and then the other thing that I have is this is like my field guide, which is kind of like my bird Bible. And, um, you know, I just, I, I come back to it so often to reread information about birds, about how they look or how they move or where you would find them and just kind of building, you know, a database of information that helps me ID them. But I think just having a sense of like wonder for the world and curiosity about what's around you is like basically what can make anybody a bird watcher. And I wanted to bring up that, um, um, you know, somebody in the chat uh, asked that they registered for this presentation um, and realized, you know, the, about the acronym for BIPOC, um, but not a person of color um, and would like to know others interested in birds and is a lifelong bird lover. Um, so it's the Urban Bird Collective for all. Um, and yes, the Urban Bird Collective is for all. Uh, what we, what, I mean, Monica, you can speak to a little bit of why this was started, but really we're trying to create more accessible spaces for people of color and the LGBT community um, because we, we weren't finding spaces um, where you can just be our whole self. But um, like we said, it is for all. So we do welcome bird lovers alike. And there's always opportunities to connect with individuals in our group, um, to go out birding um, or talk about birds and on our Facebook page um, where we try to be an open and accepting community um, to talk about this passion of ours. Yeah, and I would definitely say for birding resources to join the Urban Bird Collective Facebook group because um, the folks are always posting their photos of birds and just great helpful information about, um, uh, you know, hot spots in the Twin Cities. Um, you know, that's another, another thing we could kind of talk about. I'm not sure um, how many people on the call right now um, are actually actively out bird watching. 
um, in different areas in the Twin Cities um, or where people's favorite hotspots are in the Twin Cities. Um, but if you have questions about that, we can certainly talk about that. Um, you know, my, one of my favorite places is Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary just because it's so close to my house. And, you know, sometimes it's a whole effort with my husband and three kids to get out and, and get somewhere else in the Twin Cities to look for birds. Um, but when I do get out um, of my little neighborhood here, well, not even that far out, actually, I really do like uh, also Battle Creek Regional Park has great, uh, just so many uh, birds there, owls and um, birds of prey. And um, uh, yeah, really great places that are right in, you know, your backyards where pr previously, you know, I, I, I engaged in these spaces in different ways, but as a, as a bird watcher now, um, it's, you know, you can engage with um, these parks in your local area in new ways. Great. I have one more question backlogged, but I want to be mindful of people's time. I have a question that was going all the way back. I think, Laureen, you mentioned that sometimes you'll find multiple uh, species of ducks grouped together in the winter. And we had a question that was just in terms of like getting out and birding. Are there other sort of clues with multiple species you usually see together? Uh, other ways that sort of for an introductory birder, you can sort of spot multiple groups at the same time or sort of get like, you know, a lot of knowledge grouped in different Yeah, spots. that's a great question. I would say um, geography and time of year are gonna be your two biggest clues. Um, so we have resident waterfowl. So the trumpeter swans, the Canada geese and the um, wood ducks and the mallard ducks. Those are the four most common that you will see in and around the Twin Cities all year. Um, so if you want to like learn about identifying waterfowl, I would start with those. And then we have um, a, two different people were mentioning earlier in the presentation about the Mississippi River and the flyway. And so if you don't know what a flyway is, basically um, many species of birds do long migrations, um, often from south to north and north to south. Um, and they have these things called flyways, which are, you know, a, um, a geographic feature which they follow in their migration pattern. And so the Mississippi River is one of those. And so it makes it a really exciting place because you can go to certain spots. And then if it's that time of year when everybody's migrating, you can just see a lot of birds. Um, so the two times where you're going to see the largest diversity of waterfowl, especially migratory ones, is going to be in the fall migration where they're going. Um, from the north to the south and in the spring migration where they're coming from the south to the north. Um, and so I think if you're just interested in learning about being able to identify those types of books or birds, the best thing to do would be use something like an Audubon um, bird guide or eBird or the Merlin app or a field guide where you just you just study, um, you know, the 10 types of waterfowl that you would see during the migratory period. And then after you kind of get a sense of what they look like, then you can go and just hang out at a place like Bede Maxca or like Lake Harriet and just see there's gonna be like a hundred birds out on the water if it's migration season and you can just watch them and observe them. And that's where those binoculars are gonna come in really handy if they're farther out on the water. Yeah, the other thing I would say is um, that and so when I, I post a bird of the day and, and I would post the different ducks that I would see on these different lakes and, and my friends would say, well, I walked past that lake and I only saw mallards. And so what's really important, and this is, this is part of the journey, it's like just really being ob ob observing what's there because you might see a hundred mallards but there really are other birds within there. Um, like, you know, when the grebes come through there's eared grebes um, I should say horn grebes. So there could be like a hundred horn grebes and then, and then hiding in there is one eared grebe and the eared grebe are really rare, but they're there. Um, and so just taking the time to just look through all of those, um, those birds. Um, we, the Urban Bird Collective will also be doing another, we did a bird uh, talk, we'll do a bird talk and we'll do a sparrow and then a warbler talk. So we'll talk about what you can see and then where you can see them. So. Um, stay tuned. I wanted Sorry, to, I'm ready uh, to use those come for oh. myself. 
Go and I think <laughs> if you click them, um, the next one will be kind of a picture of um, the Autobahn Bird Guide app. Yep. So that's a free app. Um, you know, says so has more than 800 species. So great place to start. Um, even just looking um, at birds and there also is a Google map, like a map feature that will guide you to a spot. Um, and when Maggie mentioned the mountain bluebird um, that Monica ha and others have spotted by Como, I was like, oh, that's a mile away from me. I'm gonna get up early and go see it. And, and so I did, and you know, also a lifer for me, um, the first time I had ever seen it. And, um, but, I, but I also did look on my app. Um, to make sure that people were seeing it still. So great place to start. Yeah, and it's really cool because you can put a little alerts on the app. If you want to see a specific kind of bird um, in your neighborhood or your area, you can put an alert on and, and it will give you a notification when somebody spots that type of bird, you know, within your, within your neighborhood. So you can get out there, like Melissa said, get out there early. The best time of the day to go birding is early in the morning. I have found around, you know, um, and well, in, in the winter around 9 a.m. is a good time. Um, a little, maybe a little earlier, um, seven or eight in the summer. And that's when birds are out and they're um, active and they're getting their meal. And so um, that's a really good time to go birding as early in the, in the day. Um, windy days, not so great to go birding. Um, obviously when there's bad weather, um, so there's different things like that that you'll pick up along the way. And I would just say, I would just encourage everybody that's on this call, especially when um, you're, we're able, again, to be in person. There's really nothing better than going on a guided bird walk um, to hear from other people, um, learn from other people in the group, and um, kind of start, start being able to identify birds that way. So really just getting out there. Um, and in the meantime, this app is um, a close second to uh, getting out there with a guide. I wanted to sort of touch on what Maggie just said about how going for a guided tour can be a really great way to get into birding. And frankly, you're not going to find a better group to go with than the Urban Bird Collective. So I really do encourage any of you, if you haven't been birding before, or if you don't feel super comfortable, or if you've been birding and haven't felt comfortable, that this is just such an incredible group to go with. And some of the resources that we link here on the bottom, so the website Birdability, the blog post that we've shared, uh, they just talk about other groups that are trying to make sure that everybody can, can access birding. And I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for sharing your morning with us today and talking about birds and being interested in birds and, you know, how um, bird watching can not only be a, just a fun activity for us and, uh, you know, very therapeutic to get out outdoors and um, connect with nature but also, um, you know, doing the bird counts, it's, uh, as citizen science, it's very, uh, very important and um, uh, very much appreciated any work that anybody here on this call does or will do in the future to help, um, help feed into that data that helps us um, collectively um, provide protections and make, dis make good decisions for our relatives. So thank you. I wanted to uh, introduce myself. I'm Michelle Terrell. I'm the vice president of the Minnesota Ornithologist Union. Um, and as Monica mentioned, uh, through the Savoy Oil Grant Program, we've supported the Urban Bird Collective in the past. Um, and I hope that we can continue to partner and find ways to increase diversity and inclusion um, in Minnesota's birding uh, community, uh, both in the urban area, but also outside, outstate as well. Um, when I'm not birding, my other hat, I'm a, a cultural historian and archaeologist. And uh, one of the first projects, well, not the first project, but a project I worked on many years ago was with the Lower Failing Creek Project and the city of St. Paul and some of the early phases of uh, Bruce Vento Nature Sanctuary. And it's just, it's really cool to see how far it's come since it was a rail yard when I was first out there. Um, and to see you guys birding there and stuff is just really exciting. So anyhow, I just wanted to say hi. And uh, so it's good to see everybody's faces and thank you so much for this presentation today. Wow, thanks, Michelle. What an incredible connection. I know, I was gonna say, I'd love to connect with you, Michelle. Yes, I, I you know, in a post COVID world, yes, definitely, but let's keep in touch. And I think there's lots of opportunities for us to work together. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and I will say, you know, the grant and giving a, a, a pitch to the grant, they took a, they were, they were, um, what we said to them was, we want to do birding different. We want to bird by ourselves. You know, we want to create the safe space for the BIPOC and GLBT folks. And it's not about diversifying Audubon or diversifying other bird communities, but it's about creating the space for us so that we can go out. And mm -hmm. they're like, yeah. This is, this is what needs to happen. And so they've been uh, funding us for three years and it's really, I, I, I think we've done great work and we've um, created accessibility for lots of folks um, yeah. to go out and bird. So I appreciate, appreciate the support. Yeah. And the next, next grant round is uh, January 20th is the due date. So I hope you'll continue to seek support through us. We're, yeah. It's been uh, outreach through this group has been really important to us too. Good. I think Michelle, as you mentioned, right in a post-COVID world, uh, Lower Failing Creek Project is really looking to work with the Urban Bird Collective more, maybe to do some migratory and seasonal walks um, and really take full advantage of the amazing sites that we have right in the cities and people's neighborhoods. Um, that's, that's what Lorena and, and uh, Melissa and I were talking about yesterday. So um, we'll be, we'll, we'll talk. Yes. And, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to offer, um, you know, I, I'd be happy to share my email and phone number for anybody on this call that um, just wants to connect um, about birds or St. Paul or anything else. Um, I, I'll present my information to Sam and maybe you can share that and, yeah, you know, I'm I can gonna, be found on Facebook and things like that. I'm going to send a follow up email to everyone here today. And I can include Melissa's email if anybody else would like to, yeah, include, to include information in that presenters or participants, I would love to share as many resources as possible. And to that question about, uh, you know, sharing the presentation and, and the links there, I'll make sure those are available too. Um, thanks so much, Sam. Yeah. And Maggie thank you so and much Laura to our Halen presenters. Everybody. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'm going to let people go. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks for having me.